Well, hello, everybody. I am, like she said, Danielle Jasmine, Jasmine Design and Build. Um, and I'm trying out this new background today. Um, this is one of the homes I've done, the living room, and I wanted to have something a little special for you guys. Um, so uh, I'm getting used to it. But yeah, um, I'm excited to share today um, with you guys some information about me and a little bit about my journey and then also the process of really managing construction from the um, perspective of an investor. That's really something I'm passionate about with sharing other investors investors, how to manage that process. It's a huge pain point for so many people. So I'm going to go ahead here and uh, share my screen. Um, events sharing, all panelists, all panelists. That's what I'm doing. Okay, share my screen. Share. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Now just present, put it in presenter mode. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Awesome. So, um, so yeah, so I'm calling this how to CEO your reno. Um, and, um, it pretty much talks about what my process and philosophy is for investors in dealing with construction management. Um, but before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and what I've been up to. Um, so uh, my name is Danielle Jasmine. I'm a real estate investor and licensed general contractor. Um, my brand and, and company online is Jasmine Design and Build. And we also have our umbrella company, which is called M2 Rest. It's where we list all of our retail flip properties. Um, and do a variety of investment strategies. Um, and then Resource ATL, which is our newest company um, that's been running for the past, I, I think it's three years, and that's our wholesaling uh, brand and company. So I've got nine years of experiences. It's a multifaceted business at this point. You know, my primary focus is rehabs, new construction, um, short-term rentals, long-term rentals. Um, yet we also do the wholesaling, lending, and consulting. Uh, at any given time, I'm managing um, five to seven build projects. I've got 13 short-term rentals right now. I'm building out four more. Um, all of my short-term rentals are my own builds. Um, so, so I really love that approach to it. And we've got 14 long-term rentals. Um, this is important too, because I like to talk about my team. You know, a lot of people um, present and, and, and share about their business and what they've accomplished. And uh, my, my question is always, what does your team look like? Because what, what's the village that gets done everything that you do? And it's been our business as a whole, I believe is 14 years um, old. My husband, uh, Mohar Bugga is my life partner and my business partner. And so he's been investing for that long. And um, I joined nine years ago. But throughout that process, we um, have strategic built out a team for various areas of our business. And this is what it looks like now. And we're also rapidly growing. So we've got three business partners, myself, my husband, Josiah Kwanzaa is our partner in our wholesaling business, Resource ATL. Um, we have a construction project manager that's been a game changer for me for about a year now. Um, he does a lot of the um, on-site project management, so I'm not on construction sites every day, but rather just walking them once a week. That's been a big deal for us and our, our business and our ability to scale. We've got an acquisitions manager, an office manager, a transaction coordinator and bookkeeper. Um, in one. We've got uh, data entry, social media support, VA, uh, that's full-time. And then we've got three uh, full-time wholesaling VAs. So um, we're also right now in the recruitment process for a full-time carpenter to be um, a number two underneath our on-site project manager. And then also an office field assistant for our short-term rentals. Um, and that's key because they've become quite uh, the management um, and maintenance um, time suck, uh, to put it lightly. And they are a beautiful thing because the cash flow um, has been just 
amazing for our business. But as we scale them, and we're going to have 17 within the next six months, we need more than just our office support uh, to be able to, to run them out in the field. Um, so, so with all that said, that's our team. Um, and I am very, very passionate about inspiring and empowering people um, to do and manage their own construction. Um, I've spent years figuring this out myself. So I like to share and inspire others based off of what I've learned so far. So yeah. All righty. So um, how to CEO your reno. This is the approach um, that I have, the kind of mindset approach to, to what um, managing a construction renovation investment project looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, it's the goal, obviously, is to have a higher level of profitability and improve the experience of working with contractors. Um, and specifically, um, you know, this mindset and this approach is who actually rehab um, the extent construction. So it's not related to wholesaling, although mindset applies to everything as we know, but specifically that um, it's one of the gaps I've seen in, in, you know, real estate education out there that there's not a lot of focus on how to really manage that process. Um, and so this is really what that's focused on and what it's about. Um, so these are the things I'm going to cover the mindset around it team members, um, some tools of the trade, you know, a scope of work, uh, home inspections, budget spec sheet, when I touch on each one of those, and then hiring contractors, um, managing the relationship, um, and starting with the estimates, which is usually the first uh, start of your relationship with them. So, okay, there's a lot of text here, because I just kind of threw in something I had written previously, but I wanted to make sure I covered this. So this is all about the mindset around it. And I'm going to ad lib here, you're welcome to read it or screenshot it. But the general approach is that I have talked to investors, countless investors through the years, and I have had countless people, because I'm a contractor, um, countless investors come to me wanting to build, um, you know, homes for them for their investments. That's not something I do. I only do my own investment projects, but I've been privy to the approach that investors take to it um, and realize that there's a gap there in looking at how um, to really establish that relationship and how to manage it as a whole. Um, so, so just touching on mindset real quick is there's so much information out there, right? Like on TV, so-called reality TV about um, renovation projects and investments, and none of it is actually reality-based. None of the numbers are super accurate that we all see. Um, the process is edited down to a half hour or an hour show, a project that could take up to a year or longer. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it that isn't shown. And of course, it's presented in the best possible light. I too fell in love with um, home renovating and, and flipping via reality TV. So it's enjoyment and entertainment for everyone, but it is like the rosier side of um, uh, the process. And then there are things that people have heard of in real life and experienced in real life, the reality behind it, the so-called money pits or you know, stories about how a contractor done me wrong um, and how people just, whether they ran out of money or didn't uh, budget correctly or anticipate things or poor quality construction. There's countless stories in our network um, of these things happening and things that have gone wrong. And so my advice here is really that you can't wipe all of that clean, but what's really important is to actually get clarity behind the experience that you want to have, right? What gets fired gets wired. So with all of this other stuff having gotten fired, what you need to wire for yourself is your intention behind it. So outline your approach and the energy you want to put into it the kind of relationship you want to have with all of your team members. Um, and specifically, CEO Your Reno is about being the CEO overall of your investment project, right? So that means the onus and responsibility that you have to bring all these pieces of the puzzle together and all these team members together in order to have the best, most profitable output of your project for yourself. So it's about 
sitting in that position and figuring out what expertise and what people you need in all the different roles in order to have that best possible outcome. And so getting really clear about that and taking ownership and initiative when it comes to that. Um, so yeah, it's all about the accountability for yourself. Um, you know, a big misstep is that people put all the onus on contractors they search for contractors um, and, and they go through a lot of them and um, their approach, we'll talk a little bit about that later, isn't always the best, but it's really holistic. A contractor is one team member among a full team of people that are going to get you to where you need to be with your uh, construction project. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all about mindset and really the approach that that you want to be taking. So when we talk about this team members, right, this this collective that needs to happen with you at the helm as the investor um, driving the ship, uh, you have to make up for the lack of experience that you have, because most often you don't have the experience. I'm assuming you're not um, you know, familiar experience with construction yourself going into this, hence you have to hire a contractor or you'd be building it yourself. Um, but there's all these other areas as well, right? So this is um, all the list of uh, team members. There, there are other random ones that will be in there depending on the scope and what's entailed with your project. But this is the core list um, of members that you really wanna be recruiting for, building relationships with, your lender, obviously, it's about money um, and really having the capital lined up in order to fund uh, your project, uh, the purchase, and then also the build out. Um, and your, your home inspector, this is key. Um, I don't feel like people put enough uh, importance and emphasis on the home inspector. When you don't have that construction knowledge, having a home inspector who, who actually inspects your home for a pre-build and a post-build is so, so key to make up for your lack of um, experience and education when it comes to construction and also to inform Form, your scope of work and what's needed with your contractor. And then of course your contractor, uh, the person that you hire to build the, the property out. Uh, a surveyor, you know, for plans, you need a surveyor, an architect or a drafts person, depending on the municipality you're in. Um, a permit expediter, you know, some people have it easy and have like very simple permitting processes. I live in the city of Atlanta, not so much. So um, the permit process can actually take, you know, a year uh, or longer. So it's really key to have somebody actually designated to pushing that permit through um, in order to get it. An engineer, this is key too. If you're working with just a draftsman, you're gonna need an engineer um, to review and stamp plans. And then always having an engineer to come in and be able to inspect things um, and provide a letter if needed, depending on the scope of your project. And then a designer, maybe you're the designer. Maybe you've never designed a home before and you should hire somebody else to design. Um, regardless of how you set it up, somebody whose role is designated to design the property so you're not just winging it along the way and there's actually a cohesive design for uh, the home. And your agent, of course, to sell the property. That's really key. Um, and, and having an agent who, who is very knowledgeable about the market and also very investor friendly so they can work with you throughout the process um, and, and educate you, look at comps, things of this nature. So, so yeah, I talked about this um, being a big puzzle. Um, it requires problem solving, creativity, resourcefulness, um, and how much one has of these skills determines the outcome. Uh, so all of these people have been working on these puzzles for years and years and years. And so the good news is you don't have to figure it all out. You just have to get really good at finding and recruiting great team members to work with and building off of that. That's the key. Um, uh, so yeah, um, working and recruiting out for your team, 100% um, uh, uh, first start to the entire process. So some of the tools of the trade here um, are a scope of work, home inspections, a budget, a spec sheet, there are a lot of more tools that I utilize, but these are definitely some of the basic ones that are key that I wanted to just look at uh, with you guys. Um, and, you know, it goes back to that each member of your team plays a crucial role. Um, and in order for them to fulfill that role and that piece of the puzzle, they need some direction, right? So the only person with this overall vision and plan is you. 
right? I'm emphasizing that. You know what you want to have built, right? Based off of your comps, based off of whatever your investment strategy is, you know what you want the return on your investment to be. Um, and you are hiring and managing the team to make it all happen. Um, so with all that said, you are responsible for ensuring that everyone you've hired and are managing have the necessary information to fulfill their role. The main tools are these tools. So I actually want to um, look at a couple of these. So I am going to just escape from here and I have some of them pulled up so I can just reference them. Um, can you still see my screen okay? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Awesome. So this is a scope of work. Um, this is a template and then there is also an example here. Um, and so there are lots of different approaches to the scope of work. I've seen them, of, you know, built out a variety of ways. Um, you know, a lot of times homeowners or even contractors will have scope of work templates that they use that are really broken down based off of the rooms. Um, you know, there will be like bedrooms and, um, and then a bathroom and then a kitchen. Um, however, that's not the way things are built or priced out or scope is provided for, for all subcontractors. So I created very early on um, in my you know, build management uh, career, a scope of work template that works for me based off of how I found things were most often priced out and managed from a general contractor um, to their subcontractors. And what was very key for me, because I spent years managing um, contractors before I became one myself. And I realized I glazed over that a little bit. I didn't go into detail behind that, but just to give you the backstory, that's what my inspiration was um, for becoming a contractor, that I have been through many experiences, um, uh, many not so great, um, but then many that were fine, that we made it work. And I figured out where um, the, the gaps were in their ability to effectively manage a project. And I filled those gaps. And so throughout the process of hiring contractors, I really learned how to spoon feed information and provide it in the best, easiest way so that they could best manage my investment project. And what I realized is so often they, they fell short with disseminating the information that I provided to them to the subcontractors. And so I always found ways to make that process as streamlined as possible. Utilizing my scope of work was the first step. And then there are lots of tips and tricks that I use throughout um, the process as well in terms of walking the project during certain times, printing out certain things, labeling certain things so that all the subcontractors would have the information they need about the end design that I wanted as well. Um, but starting with the scope of work, you know, you got your main job summary, all that, but it's really broken up into how people do the work. So you have exterior carpentry, you know, all your siding and handrails, deck, fencing. These are things that are typically traded out with the same subcontractor. Roofing gutters, you'll have a gutter guy over a roofing guy, but concrete masonry brickwork. So it really lumps up all the different types of work on the project into these different areas. Um, and so you go through here and um, building out the scope of work without any knowledge, right? Uh, about construction would be very tricky for the average person. And so um, the goal here is to, to bridge that knowledge gap. And so I talked about home inspections, right? And so right here, I'm pulling up an example of a home inspection. Um, and this home inspection was a pre-build I get all my inspections done pre and post build. Um, a lot of people ask like, you're managing the project. Why do you get post build inspections done? Because I do not crawl into every inch of my crawl spaces or my basements or my attics after my attic blow in has been done or all my trades have come out and, and done all their set outs. And I don't, I don't inspect a home to the micro level that a home inspector will. And it's also a fresh pair of eyes so that I can tell what a home inspector would come up with um, who was purchasing for a buyer 
buyer of the home, who is purchasing the home. So it informs my punch list. It makes sure all my systems are working correctly. Certain um, building standards have been adhered to. Um, and that's the opportunity for me to have my trades come through and address any issues before we even put a home on market for sale. So this is an example of a home inspection and you'll go through it and, you know, different home inspectors all have different um, uh, things. Um, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, in here, as they list things in, um, you know, area of damage fascia, for example, this is something, a typical item that would be in your, um, your home inspection. And then what you would do is literally cop copy and paste, and you would go to that exterior carpentry, right? And you would put in under siding, you would, in this particular scope of work, it was a brick house, so there was none, but you would outline those things. And then you would actually reference inspection page numbers even. So you can say per inspection report um, throughout here. Um, and this one, yeah, I don't see any here right now, but you could say per inspection report with specific page numbers referenced. Um, that's really, so any information, in your or be provided in your scope of work and you're spoon feeding it to a con that they can actually reference it and look at it right so that's a key part of the process there all right going back here so that's a scope of work um, and then the home inspection that informs that scope of work. Um, so we also have a budget and a spec sheet. So I pulled up a couple of those as well just to reference them and have you guys take a look. So um, this is a, a typical budget of a project we recently did. Um, I utilize my budgets for my initial setting up budget, but then also for some accounting, um, which is why you see all of this uh, columns in here, because they help me manage the, the cost structure of the project as I go along. Um, and we have a really cool template that we've built out that um, gives you projections based off a of square foot count, um, what the projected overage is based off of what you spent per line items and things of that nature. Um, and so this budget is really key. Another option too is to actually have a contractor um, highlight depending on the, the level of technology savvy your contractor has. This could be something you print out and they write out if they're not somebody who's as if it's a, a cosmetic renovation um, and they're not a full scale, scale builder and it's not needed, you could have them actually just write out some costs throughout here. Um, so this could serve as a, a rough budget um, for your contractor that you establish. But I always recommend that you have an ongoing budget where you're keeping track. Um, now this has lots of transactions because I'm the contractor myself. So I have lots of management and uh, uh, transactions that I manage throughout the budget. However, this could typically just be your draw schedule, things that you might purchase for the home and then the draws that you've paid out to your contractor. So it would look a whole lot simpler um, depending on your level of involvement with the build process. So I'm also seeing a whole bunch of chats here. Um, I'll come back to them after I get through a little bit more of this. Um, so then going back to here, so then the budget. And then we have a spec sheet. Um, so, so the scope of what, scope of work, the um, actual home inspections that inform a scope of work, the budget, and then a spec sheet is really key too. And I don't know if I have one pulled up yet. So I'll do that real quick. Okay, this spec sheet isn't finalized yet, so therefore it's got some highlighted stuff in it. Um, but this spec sheet is something that um, you would also want to be working on. Now, you might not always have this completely figured all out at the start of your project. Most likely you won't. But the key here is that you have some kind of tool that tracks your actual design picks for the home um, because you do not want your contractor designing your home. Um, now, 
If you hired a contractor who does design and build all in one, that's awesome. They are probably very expensive. Um, or maybe it isn't the best design that, you, that you're looking for, but this is something I, I've heard from investors in the past or seen even. So even if you want the input of your contractor on the design, because they have more experience doing projects than you, you know, I'm assuming this is something that's um, newer for an investor. That's the, the approach here. Even if that's the case, you still want something tracking it and you want to be ready and prepared when that information is necessary during the build process. The, the example that I always like to point out for people is that um, unexperienced investors might go into a, a project and think that they have, you know, a couple of months before they actually have to pick out all of their fixtures. Well, that is not the case because the number one thing that you see um, that that's always like, what were they thinking? Or a little askew in, in home design that I see is where your shower and tub fixtures don't really correlate with other fixtures in the home. And the reason for that is that the valves for those need to be installed with your rough-ins. Rough-ins period, you know, the period after you've worked on foundation, framing, you've got your um, home sealed tight, airtight, and then there's this rough-in period where inspections happen after all your plumbing, electrical, and uh, mechanical have all been in there uh, to rough the home in. And during that period, and right before they do all that work, it's really key that the the design choices that you have in mind for the home are relayed to the contractor because the placement of everything would be very painful to change after the fact, right? There's an order of operation and construction. And in fact, it's one of the things when you go into a home, you might walk um, somebody's uh, project and if they're framing in one room and sheetrocking in another and tile in another, that's an indication that they're not very organized. They don't have a specific timeline. They don't have specific trades that come out to do specific things. Um, so that's always a little bit of a red flag to me. So, so back to this, you need to have those fixtures chosen in advance so that the valves installed will be compatible with your matching trim set out. So that's your handles. So your shower handles will match your faucet because you've actually decided on them ahead of time early on in the project. So having a spec sheet like that is, this is great where it just covers, you know, your electrical, plumbing, paint, flooring tile. This is really key because even though this one isn't finalized, um, normally there are SKUs, model numbers in here for appliances that are great reference points. Paint um, is in here, which is really key. Um, and the reason for that being that we actually provide those spec sheets to people that we sell the homes to. Um, and it just creates a process that is so much more streamlined as far as that homeowner, that new homeowner being empowered to go out and get the correct light bulbs for their fancy chandelier, go out and buy more paint to do paint touch-ups, get grout to re grout um, or caulk their backsplash in their kitchen a year later when it cracks because it's natural. It happens with construction. So it just mitigates um, a lot of the information that's needed in the back and forth after you've sold the home when you provide this, this information um, on, on the onset. And then they're empowered to, if they have an issue with their appliances, contact the manufacturer and it takes you out of the middle of that. So that's something we're really, really big on. Um, so yeah, so jumping into vetting and hiring contractors, because out of that whole team, um, that is the most, uh, thing that I'm asked about. And that is the most thing that I have found that people struggle with specifically, um, um, you know, building those relationships with contractors. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's often a painstaking process for anyone, right? Um, and it's even more difficult for, for women. Um, and that's not to say that I look at it as a disadvantage being a woman in this, uh, in this industry. In fact, for years, 
I did actually look at it that way. And I had a mind shift at a certain point where I started to realize, and this was really in line with my decision-making years ago to actually become a contractor myself as well, where I realized all of the attributes I was actually being bringing towards a process because I was a woman. And then attributes that I have myself, you know, I'm a great project manager. So I was able to really take these on with that approach. But sp specifically being a woman, there are things not to be stereotypical that that come a little easier for women and building rapport and relationships um, and and actual like respect for the work and the, the craftsmen um, that build the home um, is something that came really naturally for me. Um, and the multitasking, the being able to hold it all in and realize what was happening and being able to have know a little bit about every area in order to collectively kind of bring it all together. That's very much like um, whether you're a woman, man, um, regardless of how you identify, very much a feminine energy collectively where it's like how do we bring this village together right and so that was my approach to this right um so these are some of the tactics uh that that i actually established in vetting um contractors um so uh you need to assess their experience right and that's through conversation um so you want to ask tons of questions um and even even let me step back one step even before hey, you hey danielle can you do presenter mode please oh yes that'd be good yeah okay yeah sorry okay. that's okay okay there we go so, so stepping back one second, it's even in the initial approach to contractors, um, it's really about building a relationship, right? And so um, what not to do, right? Do not approach as many contractors as you can possibly get in touch with asking for them to bid out your project. It's not appealing or interesting. Um, this is a very busy market. And if you are a good builder, you are extremely busy right now. Um, so you're not in need of searching out a lot of work. Now, granted, there are lots of um, contractors out there who have full, you know, built out teams where they do a lot of advertising online. And so they're able to actually, you know, send out multiple crews for different things. And so they might recruit for work and, and handle it that way. But in general, every contractor is going to want to be building a relationship and not be a one and done investment project. And so that needs to be the approach with any contractors that you're reaching out to, um, because just getting bids to compare numbers, especially when they're not apples to apples, if there isn't a scope of work um, uh, in place already, then you're asking for bids based off of a judgment of a contractor without an overall vision of what the scope of work is. Nothing's going to be apples to apples. And uh, it it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's just not a smart approach to it. And instead, wanting to build that relationship, have a conversation with them talking about your project and whether or not it would be a good fit. So you discuss your high level budget, right? If you have a budget in mind, you discuss what that budget is. Um, you also talk to them and ask them questions about their experience with budgets and price per square foot. You know, they not every contractor is going to know offhand, oh, I build at this price per square foot or that, because they might not be as savvy. They might not have a fancy budget template like me where they track these things. However, they will have a general sense based off of your scope of work, what a realistic budget is um, for. And so um, that's really key to just start it with a conversation and those kinds of topics to see if it would even be a good fit, right? You talk about your roles, um, you, your role being the money, the, the project management and design, um, and theirs being to build and manage the subs um, and material. That's really key as well. You don't want to, you know, put all the onus, as we discussed, on a contractor. Um, and so it's about talking about what you're bringing to the table and, and giving them confidence in your ability to keep the money flowing. Because just as many, um, uh, just as many investors have horror stories with contractors, 
Contractors have horror stories with investors that don't have money. It dries up, don't have realistic budgets. Um, they get in over their head and they promise, make promises they can't keep because there's not enough money flowing. So, um, so that's your role that you need to take very seriously because if somebody is doing all the management of material and work, they need to trust that the money and capital, capital will be there in order to keep the project flowing. Um, and then, of course, the, the other team members you have and bringing them all together. Um, so setting up expectations on payments um, and timeline is really, really key. Uh, you can actually have um, a payment schedule uh, so that people, it's very clear, it's included part of your contract and it's very clear for them um, what the payment expectations are uh, according to the specific phases of a project. Um, and, and, and I'll just touch on that without getting too deep is that it really needs to be established based off of whatever your inspections are as well. That's a way for you to really keep the accountability there. Um, so like I was discussing during the rough in period after rough ins pass is when you pay your rough and draws. Um, so yeah, having your paperwork overall really straight, um, the scope of work, a contractor's budget, payment draw schedule, certificate of insurance, license verification, driver's license. I can't tell you how many you know, stories I've heard and, and seen with homes being built next door to a, to a home I'm building where they just sit at that, at that point um, in, the, in the project. And that's most often when you see um, investors walk away from deals is when a home is framed up and maybe roughed in, maybe not, but it just stops there. And the reason is that if the right permits aren't in place, if the right licensed subs haven't done the work in order to pass inspections and those trade permits haven't been pulled, then the work stops because you can't move forward at that point. So it's really key to confirm all these um, on the onset. You know, everyone likes to say they're a licensed contractor. Um, and, and it is so crucial that you verify that license. Um, and you can do that in a way that isn't insulting. You know, everyone shakes your hand. Yeah, I'm a licensed contractor. That's awesome. Are you the license holder is a question I used to always ask. Or do you have a partner? You know, because so often it's a partner that they have. And this partner may or may not be involved in the process or they may have someone just pulling permits for them. So I think it's, it's really key. I know it's really key to actually know what you're getting into in terms of that relationship and the actual holder of the license and the insurance and how much involvement they have with the build um, out of your investment project. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about vetting um, contractors. So we're gonna touch on some estimates here and I just wanna do a quick time check, 130, okay. So estimates. Um, so the initial start of, of, of any you know, conversation, once you've talked to contractors about specifically the relationship, if it would be a good fit, you know, you've already talked about the scope high level, the budget, um, you're at the phase where you want to move forward and you want to figure out um, based off of your scope of work that you've created, um, want to get their pricing and information from them to see if it's going to be a good fit um, economically for your investment. Um, so, so, you know, Different contractors actually structure out their estimates in different ways, right? Where some will have their overhead or their profit built in, um, and then others will have a, a breakdown of the labor and material, if you're lucky, and it's a full disclosure because you're seeing all those different costs, right? Um, but a lot of investors are uncomfortable seeing it separated out um, because then they actually get to see where the profit's built in. And unfortunately, that is not something that every investor feels comfortable with. And it's a, it's a shame. It's a real shame, right? Because then it gets to a place where you're cutting here, you're cutting there. And, and so the point that I want to make here is do not be the investor that doesn't want everybody to eat, okay? As a, a friend who's in this business, John Stafford says, 
everybody eats, right? That is one of his um, uh, favorite phrases. And I love it because your approach to this, if you want longevity um, in this industry is to build a team where everybody gets to grow and eat together, right? And so looking at it from that perspective where um, your contractor has their profit built in and having realistic conversations about what that profit is and how they're including it in there is an important part of this process, but don't let it be where you're trying to eliminate their profit out of the deal because that's the only way that they're making money, right? And it's really going to be based off of how much disclosure they want to offer. And there's not one way or or it's not one wrong way or one right way, honestly. You know, if I was going to build for, for investors or other people, I would do cost plus because I would want it to be very, very clear from the onset. This is my overhead. This is my profit. Anything we spend is solely up to the market conditions, the, the desires of different building materials, um, and different things that come up that we are not aware of during the build process. And then my profit is separate from that so that I am actually ensuring that I'm going to get paid on the deal and not work for six months um, for no money, right? But again, it would have to be with investors who are comfortable with that um, uh, and seeing those numbers broke down that way. Um, so just to give you some, you know, common construction management overheads can be 10, 15, 20% based off of the experience, the skill level, um, and the license that they have. If you're doing a, a very quick cosmetic um, renovation, you might get somebody who, who doesn't need to be licensed and is just an overall project manager, and they might make 10%. Um, on it, and you won't even need all the costs to be broke down, broken down separately. Um, however, it grows from there. If you actually are doing uh, trade work where you need licenses and you need inspections, it's going to grow to 15, 20 percent. Um, and, and, you know, the approach is that you want to do multiple projects and build a relationship with a contractor, but they're not going to give you a discount on your first project without that being proven, right? Uh, discounts are received when you give um, more work over time. So I've been able to have better pricing with all of my subcontractors because I work with them so consistently and provide so much work for them. Um, so yeah, my rule of thumb is to always shoot for a fair middle ground. Um, uh, and, and if I was not a contractor myself, and if I was recruiting for contractors to build projects, um, I would have honest conversations with them. And I would be perfectly comfortable paying 20% if they were a really good contractor who had the, the planning and the timelines and, and their budget um, managed appropriately and had a good team of subs that were going to ensure the quality construction that I was looking for. Um, and then it would be up to me, right, to figure out how to find and locate the deals that work and the scope based off of that budget. One of the common things we talk about a bunch is that you always want to um, uh, budget to your scope and not scope to your budget. And what that means is that you don't want to come up with a scope of work without any clarity on what the budget would be, because then what you're doing is you're cinching down um, the scope of work to try to actually meet it into the budget. And it's always going to be a sacrifice in quality or, or timeline or something. And so it's key to establish what your budget is first based off of your comps, based off of what the home actually needs to improve, um, and then coming up with a scope of work that fits into that budget. That's really key. So moving on here. Okay, so we're, yeah, that's the end. So I wanted to talk um, a little bit about um, some of the information um, and resources that I have available. And then I want to jump into this chat to see what questions and stuff you guys have. So this is my Instagram page. Um, you know, I I would love to and and am going to at, at some point um, come up with a educational program to really break down um, all the different aspects of 
managing a construction project for investors. I don't have that yet. Um, it's something that I've wanted to do for quite some time. But what I do do in the meantime is I share some walkthrough videos and some construction tips um, on my Instagram and, and Facebook pages. And, um, and we're actually starting up a YouTube as well, um, just so you can be more informed about different things to look at during different phases of the project. So this is my IG and Facebook, Jasmine Design Build. And then also I have a free scope of work template that we looked at earlier today. So it's a template and it's it's an example of a scope of work. And this is the actual page for it. So if you want to write that down as well, you're welcome to download that. And now let's jump into this chat. Yeah, there's some there's some chat uh, questions if you want to take a look. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay Linda, is it all oh, these are I'm trying to see where the ones start for me. Um, let me see. Let's see. Hey, excited. Um, support. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's under T. Uh, let's see who's T W. Tiffany, she's the one that asked them. She asked, "What's the best way to get started managing your own projects?" How Got do you, it. And yeah, how do you know what a good budget, budget is? And do you have any books to help us with the process? Um, so what's the best way to get started? Um, you know, I emphasize it. I mean, it depends where you're at, right? Um, and you're welcome to jump on Tiffany and um, get, let me know, um, clarify where you're at with it, but it really depends where you're at. So um, if you're starting from you have an investment project, right, and you um, are ready to do a build out, then that's what I've gone over. It's really where you want to get that home inspection. You want to become familiar with your property, input all the information from that home inspection into a scope of work, and then really start having conversations with contractors um, about what it's going to take uh, to build it out. Um, the scope of your project depends on a lot as well. If this is a cosmetic reno, then that's where you start. If this is, and this wouldn't be something that I would recommend for people to start with, like you don't want to start with a new construction, but maybe you're starting with something that's an addition or um, needs plans because it's a full gut of, of some capacity, then, then you'll need plans. So you'll need an architect or a drafts person. Um, so, so honing in on the plans of what to do to the floor plan to make it the best possible um, home to sell on the retail market. Um, so it's really with those team members uh, and getting your tools together to have the conversations and the information needed in order to recruit and build out that team. That's what I would recommend. Um, and how do you know what a good budget is? So um, that's a great question. So I talk a bunch about like price per square foot only because you, you don't know how much a roof costs or price per square foot for painting or, or tile labor is going into this, right? Your contractor will know that, but you won't. And so it's really about doing the math, like the formula of how much budget you have based off of your purchase price, based off of all your holding costs, and then what your comps are and what you're looking to sell this for um, in order to figure out what the number is of how much you can spend on this but then it's about having that conversation with the contractor about the square footage of this home and what it would take to do the things that you want to do with it. So, um, you know, right now, material costs have gone crazy through the roof. And so price per square foot is a little bit more varied. Um, but there are general ranges that they might be able to provide you um, based off of the scope of project that you can then figure out um, what your budget should be based off of that. Um, and then do you have any books to help with the process? Um, I mean, there, I don't have any books in particular. Um, you know, I have tons of books that I've read and studied in order to become a licensed contractor myself. But, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, I don't feel like there's a lot of education out there for investors to manage the construction process. Um, and so much onus is really put on the contractor and how to keep the contractor accountable and get as much as you can from the contractor. Um, but I really 
believe that it's about coming from that approach where you're the CEO of your renovation um, and informing yourself as much as possible um, about what you need. And you just need to know a little bit. Anytime I didn't know anything in the beginning, I Googled it. It's a beautiful university out there called YouTube University. And anytime my contractor said something I didn't understand, I would go home and Google that so that I would not just be trusting one contractor's opinion, but in general, have a high level opinion myself of what I thought would be the best approach when it came to that. So... And then, yeah, Stacy's talking about the all the resources that are available um, through REI USA um, that teach on flipping. And I'm sure she has tons of templates and all of these things. And she's got all these experts that teach on this because they do it. So utilizing those resources that you have in your network, that's why it's such a beautiful thing because you actually don't have to start from scratch without any guidance or information. You have these resources available uh, to you. And then Stacy's saying, um, I get the question, are there any good contractors out there? My answers are, are you willing to pay for a good contractor? Most don't want to. A good contractor is expensive, so make sure you give yourself enough spread to afford a good contractor. Amen, sister. Um, I tell you, I get literally like every day somebody messaging me, um, can you submit a bid on my project? And even if that was something I do, I wouldn't want to do it for that person because it's just the approach of the amount of time it takes to come up with an accurate um, estimate of what it will take to renovate a project is hours upon hours. Um, and so it really is a matter of, of needing information in order to get accurate pricing to you, but building a relationship with someone and not just giving them something so they can just shop out pricing with every contractor they can get to do it. Um, we can find the scope of work on your Instagram page, right? Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and change the link on my bio in IG so that it'll go back to the scope of work because we changed it for today to put this um, event in there. But I, but you can all with this at the end, HTTP. Uh, www.jasminedesignbuild.com uh, up with design on projects already started demo done um, I do offer some consulting I'll be honest with you I don't um, I don't do it a lot because I don't have a lot of time to do it um, but I do have some consulting things that I offer like walkthroughs uh, for projects just to give people high level scopes of work and some ideas um, I don't do full on management. I have too many of my own projects to do that. But um, but I enjoy walking homes. I enjoy envisioning how they could be transformed uh, to their best possible outcome. So uh, so it's something that I that I'm open to for sure. And if you reach out to me, I can give you more detail about that. Uh, we've had a home inspection, but since demo, it does not matter. So this is a gut job. Yeah. So the only times I don't get pre-build inspections are when I'm planning on fully gutting or rebuilding a home. Um, so, so definitely you don't need it then. Save your four or $500. Um, and then question, what do you mean when you talk about paying contractor 20%? Is that 20% above the cost or 20% of the profit? No, that, so that's 20% above the cost to build. So the, the profit, you and only you know. You and your lenders, maybe, but it's really, um, it's your, it's your business. You get paid last and that profit you want to protect, right? Like, um, and, and hopefully knock on wood, you get paid the most, right? That's always the goal that you get paid the most with the profit because you're the one managing and sitting at the helm for everything. But that profit is going to be determined based off of your team and how well you've managed the project and how, how good of a purchase you've made on the onset. Um, uh, and so that 20% is just on the build cost. So it's their overhead associated with it. So that's what a cost plus model would look like where it's a bill cost plus 20 percent so yeah i think that's all the questions that we had